Look through the eyepiece, you'll see A little you, a little me We're laughing recklessly Or are we yelling in the heavens Upstage a tiny train Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with jazz lyricist and singer Lorraine Feather. We had a good conversation about her story, life, and music and art along with her new 2021 CD, My Own Particular Life, done with her longtime co-producer and co-writer, Eddie Arkin. This album began in early 2019 and includes celebrated composers like Russell Ferrante, Shelley Berg, and the great Dave Grusin. She was born in Manhattan, and her parents, Jane, formerly a big band singer, and the famed late jazz writer Leonard Feather, always had music around her. She originally pursued an acting career after moving to L.A. when she was 12, but at 18, she came back to New York City and started her jazz career in her 30s. It's a great story. Enjoy. Good deal. Well, hey, thanks yeah. for taking a minute out for Neon Jazz. I appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for so, playing the album. Yeah, absolutely. So let's start off and, and talk about your latest 2021 CD, My Own Particular Life. And I, I'm curious, you know, it's coming out during a pandemic, and it's, this isn't a question about when you made this, but it's more about when it's coming out. We've had a long drought with live music, and we're still kind of figuring things out now. What's this album mean for you? It's hard to think of it separate in a separate way from – what's happened been happening to all of us during the pandemic i live alone i work remotely a lot of the time with collaborators i've i've been doing creative projects with for many years so i i was working on some some stuff before the pandemic started and then eventually decided to do it remotely but as far as when it came out is concerned, it took me longer than expected because I was waiting and waiting to be able to get together with everyone and it it just was not happening. So when it was done, I just got it wrapped up as soon as as soon as I could. I, I wanted to. It was two and a half years. So how does it feel creatively to have this project out? What does it mean to you? It's very gratifying to me. It, it's incredible to be connected to these musicians. I've been working with them for a long time. The the shortest span of time is 10 years. I would say that's Mike Valerio. Well, I'm not counting Jacob Braun, the cellist, who, whom I've never met <laughs> in person and who just he came in for one track. But I've been working with Eddie Arkin for 35 years, and it was really soul-satisfying to do this. I think everybody wanted to. The guys have always said that they love doing these projects. It's original music. They love this particular, every time I say particular now, I think about the album, but they love this particular band. And uh, I had approached each of them individually by phone saying, are, are you okay doing this with us separate? They had at that point been doing some gigs remotely anyway. And they said, yeah, absolutely. The drummer Mike Shapiro is in the Philippines now. I, I wasn't sure how it was going to work, but honestly, I, I couldn't be happier with the sound of it, the way everyone connected, doing the vocals, because I do all my vocals, lead and background, at a studio I found out about, Green Room Audio, near me in Rochester. The only thing is it was weird because Eddie... Arkin and I co-produced this, and every time I finished a take, I had to think twice about not going into the other room and saying, so, Eddie, because he wasn't there. So it was a little a little bit odd that way, but I was, I was thrilled at how it came out, and it was a very intense experience. So what do you hope the listener, those that download and buy this album, what do you hope they get from this artistic experience? Well, I hope that they connect to it emotionally. People have told me that a couple of the songs made them cry, in, in some cases uncontrollably. One was the song that I wrote about my ex-husband, Tony Morales, who has Alzheimer's, and was diagnosed at a young age in his mid-60s. It's called Music from the Ceiling. It was about a dinner I had with him the year before the pandemic hit, my last trip to L.A. when I was working with Eddie and went to see Tony, who's 
very close to me. We we stayed close after the divorce. And the other one is Sweet Little Creature, which is about my cat, Albert Einstein, mostly about a a bad experience I had that resulted in my moving from New England to New York State. And during that time, I, I put Albert in a, a little cat condo place in, in Massachusetts. And as people seem to have been very affected by that one. So I, I want them to connect to it emotionally, but also some of the music on the album is, is uh, actually danceable. So I, I'd like it to be um, exciting that way and have them feel that they want to be like, uh, you know, bopping around the house, doing chores or or just uh, getting into the groove of the music, which all of the musicians contribute to so amazingly. So you come from a pretty storied and famous lineage with your parents and Billy Holiday's involved. Mm -hmm. I want to know from you, was it a foregone conclusion that music and the creative arts were going to be your future? Looking back, yes, but it took me a long time to come around to that. I did write stories and poems as a kid. I won an award for an essay at one point, but I, I, didn't, I didn't write. I didn't think that I had much of a, a singing voice, and I decided I wanted to be an actress when I was in junior high, now called middle school, because I substituted for the lead in the Greek tragedy Electra just because I could memorize better than anyone else. And I, I got some attention from my classmates. I thought, oh, this is fun. I'm going to be an actress. I went back to New York and was in a few shows, but mostly I waitressed over and over and over and over again. Began singing just as a way to make a few bucks, and I didn't start writing lyrics until I was in my early 30s. It proved to be the centerpiece of my entire life. It was the most interesting, organic thing I had ever done. And it, it took me a long time to come around to it. But my, my father in particular was just over the moon that I, I turned out to be a lyricist because he was a prolific songwriter, not just a jazz journalist. And so that was a a real bond between us. What was the first live show that you ever saw that really blew you away, first live jazz show? I have to say, honestly, I can't remember. I just have a collage of memories. We used to go to the Monterey Jazz Festival when I was, was in my teens, and I, I remember seeing Lambert Hendricks and Ross. That was exciting because I, I listened to their, their albums. Oh, actually, it was Lambert Hen Hendricks and Bavon by the time I saw them, but... I used to listen to those albums uh, all the time with my mom and try and sing along. Uh, I saw like, Charles Lloyd, Duke Ellington, Dizzy Gillespie, who's a good friend of, of my folks. But I, uh, I don't have a, a lot of vivid memories of, of jazz shows, more like recordings. Dinah Washington was the voice I remember the most from my childhood. So, you know, the world has a perception of, of, of your father and and what he did as a journalist and who he was and your mother as a singer. But my question to you is, it's totally different when you're a child. What kinds of artistic impulses and creative dreams did they put in you that really have kind of flowered and made you who you are today as a musician? Oh, uh, that's an interesting, interestingly put question. I would just say that I was surrounded by music all the time, jazz. I didn't think anything of it. In fact, when I was in my teens, understandably, I went another way and I was obsessed with Motown and that was all I listened to. My parents were fine with it. But I, I came back around to jazz when I was, was in my 20s. I, I would just say that I had a musically rich childhood and they never expected me I, I was a terrible student. I was a real underachiever. I was just in another world all the time. And my dad said to me, look, I don't care if you go to college. I just, I'd like it if you went for at least a year, which was not very much to ask. I went to L.A. City College as a theater arts major for two years. They were cool about it. They, they didn't like it 
when I moved back to New York on my own, my mother especially was quite upset with me. Uh, they didn't expect me to be far away so soon. They were happy when something something good turned out for me. As far as what dreams they, they put into my head, I, I had no musical dreams in those days. It, it, it was just uh, much later on. And as I say, my dad, as soon as I began writing songs, he, he gave me an ASCAP form. I didn't even know there was a BMI. He just said, okay, you're going to join ASCAP now. And he took me to a meeting uh, at which I discovered that people did not want to pay for music on the radio at first, and ASCAP held the line. Of course, people now, again, don't want to play for music and stream, which is, has pretty much killed songwriting as a profession for a lot of people. It was not a childhood thing, but I always loved words, and I, I played Scrabble with my parents constantly. You know, the one thing, too, about this is that you kind of hit this later on in your life, and I'm sure early on, and even leading up to when you started writing and performing, you had all these ideas about what the world of jazz was, what it was to be a musician. Um, what was the most surprising thing or things to you about actually becoming a professional musician that kind of demystified what you thought it was? I started singing just in fits and starts. I, I got a gig singing for Petula Clark in Vegas, and the person I was subbing for said, oh, I'm just, I'm busy. My boyfriend's in town this week. I'm going to send you over all the music. I went, okay, because <laughs> I don't read. So I just, I just took this music and sort of observed it. And when I got there, I was frightened because there was a big orchestra. There's three singers. They were all very, um, I mean, three singers, including me. The other two were completely grooved into the gig, and Petula was there, and she was, you know, very lovely and courteous and imposing. And we sang it through our bunch of songs a few times, and at the end she came up and she said, oh, that's very good. I, I could not read what was in front of me, but I discovered that I had a keen ear because I just followed along a millisecond behind everyone, and by the time we'd done it a couple of times, I, I knew my parts. That was interesting. I, I, I found out that I had... Um, I, I, I had a talent. It, it didn't mean that I had a, a big, fantastic voice, but I, I had good ears, so that was demystifying. And as far as the glamour went, I got some gigs doing top 40 in the, the various New York boroughs, and, and it was six sets a night, six nights a week, minimum pay, and then 345 or whatever it was because the bars closed late the club owner would want to get on stage and sing you make me feel so young so I had to wait to get taken home I never had a car uh, by one of the, the guys it, it was a real meat and potatoes thing of just making grocery money as a singer and that was pretty demystifying so you've had the chance to be around a lot of what the world would consider legends luminary stars yeah. over the years and what, what did you learn from them, whether it's by osmosis or by direct things, the interactions that have in turn helped you teach the younger musicians and those that would be speckled by this business that want to get into it? What have they given you that you've, you've taught them? I'm not sure what I could teach anybody else other than uh, don't pay too much attention to what other people say is, is right. If something communicates to you and you think it's good advice and it's fine. Like somebody told me early on, I, I had I'd done a gig when I was, I moved back to LA, I was in my late 20s, and somebody told my then boyfriend, Lorraine needs to study with um, one of these Seth Riggs teachers because she, she has to uh, learn how to deal with her break better. And that was really good advice. I, I've used those vocalizing exercises for years and years and years. So that was good advice. But then other people say, well, you need to be more commercial. You need to do things that can get um, on the radio. And I, I've i never taken that advice. I've just done what I wanted. I've also seen that there are all kinds of different people in show business. Ella Fitzgerald was, when I met her, and my dad affirmed this, very shy. She was uh, almost childlike, soft. Spoken. She came to see me once, and she sent me flowers the next day. 
and she just wasn't didn't have a big personality in person, but she was, of course, a goddess on stage. So I learned that there are a lot of a lot of different varieties of performers and and personalities. And I, I it sounds corny, but I I think you just have to be yourself. So every day you wake up, you get the chance to create music and to put words out and, and to perform. What do you like the best about this process of being a professional musician? What's the most pleasing part of it? The most pleasing? Well, there are many pleasing parts of it for me that have to do with with writing, co-writing and producing my own albums and the surprises along the way. For example, the... The last tune that I wrote for this album with Eddie Arkin is called Are You Up? I had written a song about the pandemic over a year before. It was before so many people had died and sickened. And it was, it was sort of wry and uh, kind of swinging. And, and Eddie said to me, which he rarely does, he said, you know, Lorraine, this lyric isn't sitting well with me. I just, I, I feel different about um this whole situation i said yeah i do too let me think of something else and i uh i came up with something else which also was uh, had a a, in fact a heavier groove to it but it was about it was a somewhat surreal lyric about two people having a, a, a beginnings of an affair through texting and they couldn't they couldn't see each other, and then when they do get together, they have to walk six feet apart. And it turned out to be one of my favorite songs on the album because I, I wrote it first, which I always do. I use some kind of a template to write lyrics and rhythm. And then I gave it to Eddie, and we would work for, you know, an hour on the phone, and then he programmed something and called me back. And he did some really interesting background vocals for me on that tune. The the most involved possibly on the album and doing that and then going into the studio in this case I sang the lyrics to the demo and then we sent it to the to the drummer in Manila and all of these are preceded by a zoom call we say what do you think you want to do here and how about this and then the bass player Michael Valerio and he decided what they do so all of these different elements which were specific to the pandemic which is what the song is kind of about come together and then I go in and I tweak whatever vocals I need to do. The All of those things, and then the experience of hearing it, the rough mix with everybody doing their parts that are written and the, the parts where they're very free, and at the end having the unbelievable Don Murray mix it and, and hearing it in full. It's just it's thrilling. At that point... I almost don't care if the album comes out or not. I'm just so happy at having completed the process, which I find incredibly engaging and challenging. You know, the one thing you've mentioned a few times, and it's obviously the elephant in the room with with all artists out there, is this pandemic. And I'm wondering, what what did you learn about yourself over this time of quarantine and lockdown that's going to make you stronger as you reemerge to the stage and get more immersed in, in the world again? I learned that my, this is specific to my own situation. Well, everybody's experience is specific, but I, I, I moved here, um, in kind of a bad state of mind and the pandemic began pretty much a, a, a year later. And I was very, um, dissatisfied because I, I hadn't been, been living in an apartment for a while. And I, I am an avid gardener, and I was sort of grumbly about not being able to have a real house. And, and um, even though I, I like Rochester, and it's a, a very cool town in many ways, but uh, I was um, I, I was kind of mopey about that. And during the pandemic, doing this album, which I, of course, I think is my best, but uh, quite a few of my colleagues have said so too. It made me realize that it doesn't matter where you are, that you can you can create. Well, there are people who have written great novels from jail, so so you, that sort of puts that to rest. But I, I I also realized that I need people 
more than I, I thought. I've always been something of a loner, but not even being able to walk to the drugstore and just chit-chat with somebody behind the counter uh, began to have a, a debilitating effect on my mental state. And I, I appreciate my friends more, my, my friends, my little coterie of fans, my Facebook friends. I just, I, I treasure uh, human communication a lot more than I, than I used to. Why do you love jazz? Well, because it's, uh, it's kind of a cut above everything else. It, it, it um, takes a lot of sophistication for a musician to play jazz, and it's it, it's the music of my childhood. It's it's the the music of the holidays for me. It reminds me of my family and my my parents and all those unbelievable people who who came before Billie Holiday, my namesake and godmother, and Charlie Parker and and Dizzy. Uh, I I just um, uh, I, I put all those musicians on on a pedestal because they did something that doesn't make a lot of money, and is artistically uh, just in the, in the stars. So my final question to you is this: Everyone has a perception of you, your family, your friends, your fans, but ultimately, you live your life. You have a perception of yourself. Who do you think you are? Um, I think I'm kind of an odd duck. I, I took a long, long, long time to figure out what I wanted to do in life. Um, I'm very emotional. I cry at the do- drop of a hat. Uh, but I'm, I'm tenacious. And uh, I've, I've barreled through over the last couple decades of doing these albums. And I found that I, that at this point, I think the ideas just keep coming. So I'm very, very happy about that. I, I have a lot of, everybody has a lot of faults, but I'm like a terrible housekeeper and I, uh, I have no sense of direction at all. But um, I, I think that I, I have stick-to-itiveness, which, is, uh, which has been a, a, a good thing. And I have um, a, a certain gift for which I'm very grateful and, and friends and, and colleagues, I'm incredibly grateful for it too. So I, I think I'm, I'm lucky. I haven't had, uh, I haven't had a horrible life the way so many people on this planet do. But I've, I've had my knocks. And, um, and I, I just try and, and be more, uh, more honest, more, more responsible, and just, just keep working hard and learning as life goes by. Lorraine, thank you for opening up. Thank you for your time today. This has been wonderful. I appreciate it. Well, it's been great talking to you, Joe, and thanks for playing the album. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview. Where we give you a bit of insight into the finest singers in L.A., New York, Kansas City, and spots all over the world, giving fans all that jazz. Thanks to Lorraine for her time, music, and story. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino in the iTunes store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com and for everything Neon Jazz all the time. Go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.